Hey guys, this is Miss Parcells. You should be watching this probably on Friday, March 15th. Our class was canceled. Remember, I'm away at the Q conference learning more about technological stuff like this. You're going to be watching this instead of going to class. Remember, after you finish watching the video, click on the Google Docs link in the description and answer the questions, and that will count as your attendance for this class. You're going to want to take notes like you would in a normal class because this video is not going to stay up too much longer past this weekend. If you need to, pause it, come back to it. That is totally fine. So your take five today, you can't really discuss with anyone else, but write down some instances. When has Great Britain been invaded by foreign countries? And when has Great Britain or England been able to hold off a foreign invasion? Write it down. I'm waiting. Keep thinking. Okay. What I got, hopefully you got at least one or two of these, I thought way, way back, I thought of the Romans. The Romans were able to successfully invade, create cities. London is originally a Roman city. They built Hadrian's Wall. Hopefully you learned all about that last year. We also have the Norman conquest or the Norman invasion of Great Britain or England. This is 1066 with William the Conqueror. There's Elizabeth I. The Spanish Armada was not able to conquer Great Britain thanks to her wonderful leadership and the strength of the British Navy. And our favorite, Napoleon, he always was looking at England, never able to conquer it. So we are going to talk about Hitler's attempts to conquer Great Britain. Uh, when we had class before, we had talked about the progression of aggression, how Hitler was trying to take over or almost successfully took over all of Europe. While that had been going on, the British Prime Minister, Neville Chamberlain, had been trying to appease Hitler, to convince him or persuade him to act differently. Well, by spring of 1940, Neville Chamberlain was really ill. He had, um, he had cancer. So he resigns. And the king, George VI, then asks his friend Winston Churchill to be Prime Minister. This is the same Winston Churchill who we saw as an epic failure at the Battle of Gallipoli. He had rebuilt his political career and become indispensable. He was one of the favorites of King George VI. So this is May 1940. The war is just about to begin in England. And when Churchill became Prime Minister, he gives this speech on May 13th, 1914 to the Parliament. Sorry, 1940. May 1940. And he says, This House welcomes the formation of a government representing the united and inflexible resolve of the nation to prosecute the war with Germany to a victorious conclusion. He's already thinking positively that there is no other option but to win. He goes on to say, I say to the House, as I said to ministers who have joined this government, I have nothing to offer but blood, toil, tears, and sweat. We have before us an ordeal of the most grievous kind. We have before us many, many months of struggle and suffering. You ask, what is our policy? I say it is to wage war by land, sea, and air. War with all our might and with all the strength God has given us, and to wage war against a monstrous tyranny never surpassed in the dark and lamentable catalog of human crime. That is our policy. You ask, what is our aim? I can answer in one word, victory. It is victory. Victory at all costs, victory in spite of all terrors. Victory, however long and hard the road may be, for without victory, there is no survival. I feel entitled at this juncture, at this time, to claim the aid of all and to say, come then, let us go forward together with our united strength. Now this beautiful sort of grandiose speech making 
Uh, Churchill had done this for years. It made him one of the least favorite members of Congress in the early 19... Or sorry, Parliament. He's a member of Parliament. He's British. Um, one of the least favorite members of Parliament in the early 1900s when he first was a representative. Um, but with the sort of the coming of this war, he is going to be the person that's going to lead Britain through it. He is going to be the figurehead. He is going to be sort of... Uh, the hope that people look for, and he says, you know, we're gonna we're gonna do whatever it takes to win. It might take a long, long time, but we are going to be successful. And it wasn't just an idea; they weren't just guessing that Hitler would try and invade. Um, it really seemed that he had made his way through all of Europe. He had gone sort of in this circle, the progression of aggression. All of these countries had fallen. And especially after Dunkirk, when the British soldiers leap into the British Channel, the English Channel, to get to safety, it seems like Hitler must be coming for England next. And he was. His plan was called Operation Sea Lion. Here's Churchill, ready for anything in his cute little helmet. Operation Sea Lion, or in German, Sie Löwen, called that because it would be amphibious. Uh, Hitler would use U-boats, he would use the Navy to land on the beaches of England and conquer it. This was his goal. And Churchill is going to be the guy that leads Britain through this war. They are going to need someone to lift their morale, to make them feel it is possible to f defeat this enemy. Churchill is just the man at just the right time. Uh, this is from a TV movie made about Churchill, and this is one of his most famous speeches. Okay, so he's saying that, you know, um, well, this is an another excerpt that says, it says, you know, the general says the Battle of France is over. I expect that the Battle of Britain is about to begin. Upon this battle depends the survival of Christian civilization. Upon it depends the, um, our own British life and the long continuity of our institutions and our empire. The whole fury and might of the enemy must very soon be turned on us. Hitler knows that we will have he will have to break us in this island or lose this war. If we can stand up to him, all Europe may be free, and the life of this world may move forward into broad, sunlit uplands. But if we fail, then the whole world, including the United States, including all that we have known and care for, will sink into the abyss of a new dark age made more sinister and perhaps more protracted by the lights of perverted science. Let us therefore brace ourselves to our duties, and so bear ourselves that if the British Empire and its Commonwealth last for a thousand years, men will still say, this was their finest hour. So the actual Battle of Britain happens in the summer of 1940. Now Hitler, remember, he wanted to invade by sea, but first he is going to use the skies. It is going to be, this is um, purely an air force battle between the two air forces of the countries. What happens is the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, starts bombing air bases in Britain, trying to disable British planes. The British planes from the RAF, the Royal Air Force, they're going to go up and dogfight. Now that's sort of like when you're playing chicken in the pool and it's a, a plane against plane, or you know, you're shooting down planes. The people of England are looking up in the sky. They might be you know, sweeping the front porch, and they look up and they see these battles happening. So again, this is the Luftwaffe, the German Air Force, versus the RAF, the British Air Force. Um, with technology, you know, we keep talking about how Germany had advanced technology. They had started building their army earlier. At first, it seems like the Luftwaffe is going to win this, no problem. They have more planes, more pilots. They also have better planes at the beginning of this conflict. But as the war continues, or sorry, as the battle continues specifically, the British start producing a new type of plane. Um, so, okay. So this is reading from my book, 
great tales from English history. It says on the July 10th, the German July 10th, the Germans put the first stage of their strategy into practice: dive bombing merchant ships in the English Channel. Apart from sinking vital cargoes, their plan was to lure British fighter planes out to give battle. Since the Luftwaffe probably had three times more planes than the RAF, it would only be a matter of time before Britain was defenseless. Every fighter pilot depended on a massive and complex pyramid of support staff. Radar technicians, the observer corps, searchlight and barrage balloon operators, chart piloters, telephone operators, telephone engineers, dispatch riders, signalers, and runway repair crews. Not to mention the mechanics who produced, maintained, and repaired the fighter planes that enabled the few to win their dogfights. The inside story of the Battle of Britain was the triumph of many. So this is not just you know, a few fighter pilots. This is everyone making it happen. And when Churchill came to power in May of 1940, he had created a whole new cabinet position, the Minister of Aircraft Production. And he says, manufacture was already running smoothly. 163 new Spitfires, a type of plane, came out of the factories that August, along with 251 hurricanes. The Germans could not match this turnaround rate. The British, were pro they were producing way more planes than the Germans. And they were also using any planes that were shot down. They were cannibalizing them, using them for spare parts. No one realized it at the time, but from mid-August to mid-September, each day of the Battle of Britain saw the RAF lose significantly fewer planes than the Luftwaffe, 832 in total to Germany's 1,268. On September 17th, Hitler postponed the invasion of Britain, deciding that Russia offered a more attractive target, and at the end of October, he effectively admitted defeat when he switched from daytime fighter attacks to nighttime bombing. So Britain got with the program. They started building the planes that they needed. Uh, Britain also had an early form of radar, so what we see all the time in movie and television is being able to see the enemy on the screen, even though you can't see them with their eyes. Britain has an early form of this, and that's massive. And also, one major benefit the Royal Air Force has is geography. The British Air Force bases are here in England. They're fighting this battle over the over England's English skies. The German planes are based in Germany, maybe by this time the Netherlands, but mostly in Germany. That means if the British planes have to refuel, they're fighting, they're fighting, they're fighting here, they refuel, they just dip right down and pop back up and fight. If the German planes have to refuel, they have to fly back to Germany, maybe the Netherlands or France. So it takes that much longer for the Germans to the German Luftwaffe to fight this. So Britain is going to be able to be successful with this battle. Um, and it's happening. The, the British people are watching it over their heads every afternoon in the summer and early fall of 1940. And this is going to be the the beginning with the sort of the end of this battle. It's going to be the beginning of total war. And you can see that here in this clip from a movie called Mrs. Miniver. Okay, so you can see in that movie clip that everyone is affected by this war. We saw that in World War One with DORA, um, Defense of the Realm Act, and everyone is, is adding to the war effort. But now with total war, civilians are considered targets. There is no difference between a military target and a, um, a civilian target, It's as long as it does damage. It also means that there are civilians who are getting involved in military action. So we have lots of resistance groups, especially in Europe, in these countries that had been conquered by, um, by Hitler. Uh, one of the most uh, famous resistance movements was in France. Now, at first, starting in 1940, when they're taken over, it was really disorganized. Over the next year, year and a half or so, the exiled French government, they have, were running France, or they were trying to uh, organize the resistance from offices in London. Um, these resistance groups at first were printing newspapers and propaganda to people saying, like, the Nazis are horrible, we know we, the French must unite. As they start getting help from these exiled governments, the resistance movements start getting intelligence, sending information back to the French and British in London. They start sabotage and guerrilla warfare against the Nazi occupiers in their country.
and there's all sorts of cool stories about individuals who made a small difference, but it was it was enough. It was enough to get um, get something done. One particular person I want you to know about is Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Bonhoeffer was a German. Um, he grew up in the church. He was one of those pacifists that we've talked about that says war is wrong. I do not agree with it, uh, mainly on religious grounds. But when the Nazi party came to power, he really was against the Nazis. He felt that Germany was turning into this worship of Hitler. And he just completely thought this was wrong. He was too young to become a ordained minister in Germany. So he traveled to the U.S. to go to seminary. He went to the U.K. And he went back and forth for a few years. When he finally came back to Germany and established a church, one of the things that he would preach was about the Jewish people. Going back to the Old Testament, that the Jews were, you know, God's chosen that they were special, that they were unique. And he was doing this in the mid-1930s, sort of um, flouting the Nazi idea that the, that the Jews are undesirable, that they are beneath pure Aryans. Um, he goes back and forth to the U.S. a few more times because he just was getting fed up with the Nazis. He happened to catch the last boat back from the U.S. to Europe before they cut off all passenger travel because they're trying to think ahead. Hey, unrestricted submarine warfare might happen again. He created an underground church. So by this time, lots of churches were severely restricted in Nazi Germany. He creates an underground church, meaning it is not very public. It's very secretive to just, you know, create this, crea this Christian culture in a government that was trying to get rid of any opposition, anything that would vie for attention away from Hitler. In 1940, about 1940-41, Bonhoeffer joins Abwehr. Abwehr was the, um, the spy agency of Nazi Germany. There actually were a lot of pacifists, anti-Hitler types in Abwehr, in this spy agency, um, because they were, they were able to get access to the secret information and create plots to attempt to overthrow Hitler. So Bonhoeffer was engaged in a number of these plots. And in 1943, he was arrested by the SS. And it had nothing to do with any of these plots to overthrow him. It was actually just because the leadership of the Abwehr did not like the leadership of the SS, and they had this long-running feud. So he just happens to be arrested. He's thrown in one of these concentration camps, and he's there for a year and a half. He establishes, he has, you know, Sunday church services. And by spring of 1945, the war is coming to an end, and the head of Abwehr gets paranoid, and he says that all former Abwehr agents who are being held as prisoners must be executed. So in April, of 1945, two weeks before his camp was going to be liberated, Dietrich Bonhoeffer was hung as um, an enemy of the state. And one of Bonhoeffer's students who was in the camp with him said this about his death. He said, I saw Pastor Bonhoeffer kneeling on the floor, praying fervently to God. I was most deeply moved by the way this lovable man prayed, so devout, so certain that God heard his prayer. At the place of execution, he said again a short prayer and then climbed a few steps to the gallows, brave and composed. His death ensured that after his death ensured after a few seconds. In the almost 50 years that I worked as a doctor, I have hardly seen a man die so entirely submissive to the will of God. Now, since this time, uh, Bonhoeffer has become just sort of a symbol not only of Christian theology but of opposing what is wrong and attempting to do what is right, um, what is what would be the will of God. So we have those types of resistance movements. We also have resistance in popular culture, in the media. Now, this wouldn't be necessarily within Nazi Germany, but certainly in America. Um, there are lots of films, um, radio programs. One of them, um, we, have, we have a Disney clip. Disney would create these cartoons for kids trying to show how horrible the Nazis are.
So at first, you know, Donald, we love Donald. He's funny. He makes that funny noise. And we're starting to see that whoever the boss is over him is having a lot of power. Even if these kids who are watching this don't, aren't you know, totally aware of the politics behind it, they can tell that whoever is controlling Donald is not good. And then one of my favorites, Charlie Chaplin, who was a silent film star, makes this movie called The Great Dictator in 1940. Uh, Chaplin was originally British. He had lived in America, though, for quite some time. And in seeing what Hitler was doing, he was absolutely appalled. So he makes this movie, and it is, it's really, I haven't seen the whole thing, but a lot of it, the parts that I've seen are great. It starts off in World War I with this Jewish barber who is fighting in the trenches, and he saves a fighter pilot. Uh, from from death, this German fighter pilot, and this fighter pilot says, you know, I will I will owe you my life forever. Then the Jewish barber is injured and gets amnesia for you know 15 years. Fast forward to the present, meaning um, you know late 1930s, and the Jewish barber sort of regains his memory. In the time he's had amnesia, a dictator has taken over their nation of Tomania, and that is Adenoid Hinkle the dictator of Tomania, and the head of propaganda and information is Herr Garbage instead of Goebbels. And the thing is that Adenoid Hinkle and the barber look shockingly similar. There's eventually going to be sort of a swapping, an accidental swapping of identities, but this first scene, very famous, is of the dictator, Adenoid Hinkle, deciding sort of what should he do with his goal to take over the world. We've had this wonderful dance, and I love when he hits it with his bum, and it pops in his in his arms. Then one of the last scenes of the movie, um, the barber and the dictator accidentally switch identities through some hilarity, and they get the barber and say, well, you have to go make this speech. And he makes this speech that is just, it's one of my favorite uh, scenes from all of them, so take a look. Okay, well, I hope you liked those clips. Please, please, please click right now on that, that Google Docs link in the information in the description. Answer those questions. Get it done. And I will see you guys next week.